Hello everyone, welcome to this EdenNAP webinar. We are very happy to be here with you. Uh, we still have people uh, joining us. We have uh, many uh, people who registered for this webinar. So we are very happy to, to share all our experience uh, with you. Hello to people both on the Zoom platform and also on the YouTube uh, channel. Um, as I said, this is uh, an Eden webinar and I'm welcoming everyone who uh, is attending. Our topic today is designing online courses, a practical approach, and I will shortly uh, move to, to the agenda of this webinar. Today is the 7th of October, only two days have passed since International Teachers Day. So happy birthday to all of us. As I also mentioned uh, during the webinar on Monday, in these times, we have the opportunity to be leaders of our communities. And I strongly encourage you to do that. And I'm sure you are doing that. Uh, please uh, write uh, in the chat uh, your name and where you are coming from so that we can, uh, we can uh, meet each other at least virtually. Uh, we see we have people from uh, many places, from many continents. We have people from Greece, from Ireland, from Switzerland, from Palestine, from Paraguay, from Romania also, Croatia, many, many countries. Thank you all for joining this webinar. Um, this webinar is organized by the Eden NAP, the Network of Academics and Professionals, uh, which has a purpose of encouraging uh, collaboration and uh, uh, networking possibilities for Eden NAP members. We are around uh, 1,000 members all over the world. And uh, it is uh, my pleasure to uh, give a start to, to this uh, webinar by uh, presenting uh, uh, my co-anchor, uh, so to speak, my co-moderator, uh, very good colleague of mine from the NAP steering committee. Um, so please let me introduce uh, Igor Balaban, um, associate professor um, at FOI, vice dean for science, uh, international cooperation and projects, uh, head of laboratory for advanced technologies in e-learning. He's coming from the University of Zagreb in Croatia. Um, Igor, please, the floor is yours. Thank you a lot very much. Dear ladies and gentlemen, dear panelists, presenters, dear uh, participants, uh, welcome. As Vlad already mentioned, we are very honored to have you with us. We are, we are pleased. There is a really respectable number of you attending and it's very glad to see you from all over the Europe. Um, as Vlad already mentioned, two of us would be actually uh, co-supervising this session. Um, hopefully, uh, we will get many, many uh, interesting uh, examples of um, in-course usage of, uh, I would say, new trends in e-learning. As already mentioned, the title of today's webinar is Designing Online Courses, A Practical Approach. So within this webinar, we would like to see how to efficiently transfer teaching practice online, uh, at the same time, avoiding to use learning management system as online repositories. These days, um, teachers are actually forced to move online. Many of them have been doing that practice for many, many years, but still, uh, many of them have been using just LMSs as the online repositories without actually moving uh, the teaching methodology online. So with, with this webinar, we would like to pinpoint um, some e examples, some useful examples on how this can be done in a very efficient way by listening to our uh, speakers that, uh, that I will announce in uh, just a couple of minutes. Um, Considering the, uh, I would say the, the, the main topic, which is design online course, how to design online course, we have actually two uh, subtopics. The first one we want to tackle is um, about the best practices that are related to instructional and learning designs used in different online courses. And for that purpose, we um, have Mark Lampere with us and Marian Krasna, two professors that will speak more about that subtopic. And in the other part of the webinar, we would like to see 
uh, the, the issues with integration of MOOCs in online courses. And for that, we have um, Professor Jenkins Hakan Aynum and Vlad Mihaescu, which is also a uh, supervisor of this, of this um, webinar. So as for the layouts, we have four presenters, two subtopics. We will allow 10 minute presentation per presenter. And then we will see, depending on the number and the type of your questions, we will decide whether we will have the questions immediately after the presentations, or we will actually uh, just do the presentations first, and then we will allow uh, for a discussion. So, uh, as the first presenter, I would like to announce Mark Lampere, which is a senior researcher from senior researcher from the Center of Educational Technology, Tallinn University, Estonia. Mart holds a PhD degree in educational science, as you could have read from his bio. Uh, while his main focus in the research is conceptual design and analysis of affordances of technology enhanced learning systems and tools, assessment of digital competence of teachers and digital maturity of schools, instructional design, the practice of computing education. Mart is also a member of a steering group of National Strategy for Lifelong Learning and has contributed to development, piloting, and implementation of European digital competence models such as uh, DICCOM, DICCOM Org, and DICCOM Edu. Mart, please, the floor is yours. Please share, our present, uh, please share your presentation. On the microphone, Mart. Um, I'm trying to find the right window now. Uh, for sharing. So, uh, 10 minutes is not much for academic people who are uh, used to uh, talk for uh, 90 minutes in a row. Um, uh, but I'm, I'm trying to be brief. Uh, so I'm teaching instructional design uh, uh, to master students uh, here in Tallinn University. Uh, and uh, uh, partly because of that, I'm, I'm, I'm going to share this my experience with you. But I, I also put this uh, uh, practical uh, guidelines of instructional design uh, into practice uh, recently in different contexts, in, in uh, swapping my own courses, uh, uh, which were blended courses anyway. Uh, but uh, at some point in spring, I had to switch, uh, switch them to fully online. And also I was uh, consulting my, my colleagues uh, to do the same. Uh, and uh, I, I'm right now uh, consulting also my other colleagues in the training company uh, where we, we have been providing Erasmus uh, uh, Key Action 1 mobility courses uh, to hundreds of European teachers. Uh, and now we are trying to, to switch these courses also online. And one thing that we learned is that uh, that you, you cannot uh, or you should not transfer uh, the pedagogical design that you used for your on-site course uh, uh, to, uh, to fully online version. It, it, radical redesign is needed. And uh, of course, when you, you need some uh, knowledge and support, it's uh, always a good idea to ask a, a specialist, a specialist in redesigning the course. Uh, actually, uh, they belong to the community of uh, professional instructional designers. Uh, they have lots of uh, good uh, 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 ideas, models, uh, guidelines uh, for, for redesign process. Uh, and actually, this redesign process eventually even might help uh, you when you uh, turn back to you, your uh, uh, normality and the uh, normal face-to-face -face courses uh, because during this redesign course you usually discover some uh, some uh, design decisions you made uh, and uh, uh, so that you didn't even notice and they actually harm your course uh, and uh, one thing I, I recommend recommend is uh, to 
to start with the really agile uh, approach. It means that to, to get uh, very fast of the first uh, part of your course uh, online and then monitor carefully that what happens and uh, use this uh, feedback uh, from, from your first experiences for redesigning the second part. You don't need to redesign the whole course uh, immediately when uh, this another emergency distance education uh, uh, period uh, uh, begins. So what is instructional design? It's the uh, systematic process uh, by which instruction is improved through the analysis of learning needs and systemic development of learning materials and learning environment. Uh, so uh, I have tried in my instructional design uh, several, I think at least four courses now during the last 15 years, but uh, uh, last uh, five years, I, I have uh, used uh, Merrill's uh, uh, model. Uh, and first, we start uh, with, the, with the principles of, of uh, instruction uh, uh, defined by Merrill. And actually, they're, they're quite common and very logical. That he says that, uh, that uh, learning is promoted when the learners acquire concepts and principles in the context of real world tasks. So it means that uh, you can design your course only uh, 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 with the help of uh, structuring it uh, through tasks. Simple tasks in the beginning, a little bit gradually more, more difficult tasks uh, next and end up with uh, uh, tasks that are performed completely independently already uh, based on the, the skills acquired through practice. Uh, and, and this is what, what I wanted to share with you. Uh, uh, so Merrill calls this uh, instructional design model pebble in the pond, uh, probably just uh, by uh, using some mnemonic tricks uh, to, to help uh, you to remember his model, uh, because other models are usually consisting of boxes uh, uh, or or, uh, or swim lanes or something like this. Uh, but basically, Merrill has also like uh, uh, generally a linear idea, uh, but uh, there is one very important part of Merrill's model, and this is scaffolding and and uh, a kind of like problem-based approach. Uh, and the main uh, idea that uh, is different for, for, for Merrill is that he suggests to select uh, uh, three to five real life uh, cases and then to reuse for uh, all of your tasks throughout your course. Uh, and uh, uh, First, still, uh, after identifying these three real-life cases, uh, he uh, uh, asks you to, to analyze your, the, the components of your instruction, that what do you want to explain, what facts, concepts, uh, procedures, and rules, and how do you want uh, to deliver it. Uh, and uh, there is a very simple uh, model for component analysis, uh, uh, in, in four types of uh, resources, uh, tell, show, ask, and do. In tell, you explain something in generic terms like definitions of concepts or uh, general uh, procedures. In show, you illustrate with real life uh, examples. In ask, you uh, check uh, with uh, self uh, assessment uh, or interactive exercise whether the students understood this tell and show. And then you give uh, practical assignments, uh, do, where students have to actually complete it uh, in, in real life practice. So this is the course uh, 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 I, I use for demo, uh, uh, the course of teaching Microsoft Excel to uh, 15 years old, old youngsters face-to-face. Uh, -face. And now when we switch it uh, online, uh, we start for defining these uh, whole tasks or re real life tasks. Uh, so uh, if we teach Excel to youngsters, we don't use this uh, uh, staff cost sheets uh, or, or time sheets, uh, which are uh, typical uh, starting points uh, for uh, adults in the office situation. But we, we pick the real life case, which is relevant for youngsters. It means collecting and anal analyzing data about classmates, for instance, sport uh, results. And then you design this show and tell and show and ask and do sequences uh, of uh, screencasts, texts with images, 
H5P self-tests or interactive exercises. Uh, this has become one of my favorite tools recently, and I really recommend it to, uh, to use for, for this ask type of activities. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, this uh, H5P is actually the bundle of uh, 40 different interaction templates, uh, including interactive video. Uh, that any teacher can easily use and then embed or or import it to uh, your Moodle platform, or uh, you can also use it outside of your LMS. Uh, but uh, through uh, redesigning your course as a part and sequences of this show, tell, ask, and do uh, components, uh, 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 you are guaranteed to to give really practical uh, and new look to your courses. And after the emergency distance education period is over, uh, I can guarantee you will not uh, uh, switch back to traditional lectures. So this is it from my side. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mart. That was really, really fast. Much <laughs> faster than you <laughs> announced in the beginning. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, as I couldn't see any questions raising uh, in the chat window, uh, I suggest to move to the second presenter and then to leave discussion after uh, the other presentations are done. So thank you very much, much, Mart. I think that was very, very, very useful. I would say uh, a quick tips on how to do it um, efficiently. Okay, uh, our second presenter is uh, Professor Marian Krasna, who comes from University of Maribor. Professor Krasna Marian is working in the area of application of computer education and didactic strategies of teaching with ICT. Uh, Marian is the head of Center for Information Communication and Interactive Technologies at the Faculty of Arts. He was also appointed to the work group for development of e-learning at the University of Maribor. He was a head of quality control committee at the Faculty of Arts. He is also a member of steering committee of Croatian Society for Information, Communication, and Electronic Technology. And uh, he is also a long IEEE member when he was the head of IEEE education section in Slovenia. Uh, if I understood correctly, uh, Marian is today with his uh, students in the classroom, hopefully having some students physically present there, and they will also be joining this session. So, Marian, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Igor. Um, I have to tell you this. Uh, Igor called me and says, I need you to be my panelist. I says, when? He says, next Wednesday. I says, could you be more specific? He says, five o'clock. And I said, it's going to be really, really nice schedule. So yes, I have students at the same time. So I'm going to show it to you. These are my students. Please wave. As you can see, um, we have to maintain uh, social distancing. It's a, half, a meter and a half from each student so they can uh, take the masks off and we can communicate. Anyway, um, I'm going to start my 10, sec 10 minutes now and uh, give you a presentation about uh, instructional design. And um, well, let's me see. Um, we have a course that uh, has a title Information Support for Didactic Strategies. And uh, these are my students today. And uh, if it's working, I will show you. It, this course has 30 hours lecture, 30 hours tutorial, and 120 hours individual work, and worth six ECTS. Uh, this is quite a large course in, in our uh, studying program, so uh, we have to do quite a substantial working in instructional design. So, what to do in this course is uh, to do didactical strategies in different educational levels, um, influence, ICT support, and test cases. But, you know, we try to do it a bit different because I have a free hand, so I do a course as a project and learning by doing. So uh, the first thing I want to uh, give to my students is teamwork, uh, because I have seen a lot of courses that actually uh, depends on individual work all the time. So 
in real world, real world uh, it's teamwork. It's not individual work. It's team, and always you you have to ask somebody because you're not the wisest guy in the world. So how to form the team, internal and external communication, work assessment and relation, and human resource management. And how to do this? Well, as you can see, um, I'll have to skip this on the other side. Uh, first, uh, we do uh, online team forming. Then I give uh, them a contemporary problem and they have to do a work day breakdown structure and assignment, uh, do the progress, uh, do a presentation and report. And finally, evaluation, because every time we do anything at the end, it's an evaluation phase. The second uh, task is how to do the goal definition and constraints, planning, organizing, scheduling, control, and also SWOT analysis. And uh, how to do this? Well, uh, I give them the assignment, how to do a round trip around hometown. hometown. Uh, it actually involves, highly involves the teamwork. And uh, we give them a competition as a team competition, which is positive competition. Individual competition is not always positive. It might be negative and it is more negative than positive. Then they have a presentation, proposal election, field trip, and also evaluation at the end. Uh, then we have um, a distance education. As you can see now, now they have practical experience how this can be done. So preparation, how to do a collaboration, how to do a document repository, uh, meeting a schedule, a schedule meeting, uh, video conferencing lectures, and uh, also do the evaluation to do how to get it back uh, better or worse. So they're gonna get a self-assigned task. They can pick a task for themselves and do a preparation. So they can prepare learning material. They can use learning management system and do a presentation. Uh, it, it's totally by their doing, they can be a creative as much as they can be do. And they also prepare tests. So they, they have to know how to prepare electronic tests. And uh, afterwards they do a presentation of how to see some kind of a evaluation and they do it as a report. Uh, flip classroom is also part of this. Uh, so what is the flip classroom is a theoretical background uh, goals of the flip classroom strategies. Preparing flip classroom, a teamwork and result presentation, um, uh, discussion and also at the end evaluation. So, I have um, tried to uh, do a flipped classroom with the flipped classroom. So why not? These are students that are not in first year. They're actually five uh, senior students at the last year. So they can do it. They study the resources. They select the appropriate YouTube videos, um, lectures with the colleagues. And uh, we la later have a discussion because uh, they can always uh, tell each other what they could do uh, better, what was um, what was not so good, how can they uh, be uh, better in the end. Uh, so how to do a student's, act, student's active involvement? Um, well, we can do active involvement in the classroom and also in online. And uh, we have seen in the past semester when we were first uh, going online for, for or true that uh, many of our colleagues have a problem with the uh, students' involvement. Uh, much of the time we could see that students actually uh, enrolled to the start of the classroom and uh, they started to, uh, you know, being present and after 90 minutes they were still present and after two hours they were still present. So they're probably going out, you know, and not being on the, on the class. So, how to do it uh, pro and contra, the different principles, online tools for student activation, gamification, study if yes or no, where yes, where no, social network in education, you know, these are the questions. So, uh, I give student research uh, the topic, then uh, they study resources, test the different tools, and then they do a testing with the colleagues. Um, at the end, we have a discussion and uh, also evaluation. And uh, uh, I find out it, uh, it is interesting because uh, if you do it in the groups, uh, each groups find different solutions 
And when they compare them, at the end, uh, gives you the positive results. Um, also, we, we must not um, leave out uh, economics of education. Um, we're, we are bound with the law and recommendations. Uh, there is also a budget and the cost in education, analysis of public available data and reports. So how to do this? I give them an assignment to analyze uh, their home schools. They will study online material, gather the data, reports from the Google Maps. They will actually try to find the matrices and recommendation checks because and the, our ministry have the recommendation for the primary school. And they will do reports and final discussion. It's interesting what, you, what they find out about what they should have been done and what reality is. And uh, for the end, I would say, um, uh, active use of ICT is something that is not new to some of my colleagues, but it is very, very new for the others. And uh, I think that uh, ICT is not a, a cure, it's just a tool. So application of ICT in student work is, is not something that uh, should be, uh, you know, as, as odd, strange. It's uh, because every our, stu every our students have... Uh, lived and live with uh, their interactive devices every day. They have uh, smartphones, they might also have uh, computers, laptops, whatever. And they use it not once a day, I would say, they use it many times a day. And uh, we must not uh, forget that collaboration and communication is really paramount in, in this environment. And uh, you have to find uh, the right way and right amount where uh, you could cut off and how to do a right communication path. Because if everybody can communicate with everybody, you get chaos. Then, uh, you know, the students actually, when they make a self-evaluation report, uh, they uh, find out um, at the end what we actually go through or our course. And uh, I really would like them to, to, to be a creative. So I, quite annoy them because I don't give them uh, how to do it. I just give them, you have to do this. How you're gonna do, it's not my problem, it's your to solve. So I think that this is uh, my time and uh, I thank you for your listening. If you have any questions, you can ask me. And yes, uh, please don't make a clear distinction between lectures and tutorial, because if you want to do it like I do, then you, you can't do it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marian. Uh, it has been really, really nice to hear that. Uh, actually, the, the funny thing, I have had some education in the past uh, months for other teachers of higher university. I have educated more than 100 people <laughs> through my workshops and pretty much all of them had the similar issues that you mentioned in, in, in your, in your uh, speeches, how to, how, to, how, how to use properly the ICT not to, actually how to use ICT as a help, as the add-on, not the other way around. Um, maybe Maybe just um, since we have reached the, um, I would say, uh, thematically, we have covered our first topic, which is about how to integrate instructional or, or and or learning design used in different online courses. We have had a fruitful discussion in the chat window between Mark and the rest of the world, I would say. Uh, we also have had some um, YouTube questions of, of, or live questions for Marian, but I would first just like to um, refer to the um, uh, to the communication between Mart regarding the question about the time frame needed to move the or to switch the teaching from face to face to online. I've noticed that Mart has tried to provide the answer in the chat window, but I've said that I will note down the question because this, this question is a rather complex, especially uh, in ways how to evaluate if, is, if the new way of delivering course is efficient or not. So maybe I would first like to ask um, Mart 
if he would like to add up something to that specific question. Yes, in the spring, uh, I believe that all of you uh, or most of you experienced this, the same thing that uh, this uh, pandemic situation and, and also uh, uh, closure of schools uh, uh, happened so fast and unexpectedly that you didn't have time to, to really uh, implement a fully uh, full redesign uh, process of your course. It means that you had to do it on the go. It means uh, when uh, school closure was announced, uh, you probably will, were able to only redesign the first part of your next uh, contact day or, or lesson or something like that. And uh, it felt at that time as this is like a firefighting uh, method, but actually uh, this is quite common uh, uh, method of organizing the work in, in startup software uh, engineering companies. They call it agile method. It means that you, you try to come up very fast uh, 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 with the with, with solution that can be already shown to, to user, your, your customers, or in our case, to our students. And uh, uh, it's not necessarily the, the bad idea. Uh, to, to start Agile, to, to, to do this uh, design uh, during your teaching, because this eventually improves your, your course much better. Uh, but of course, most of the instructional designers would uh, uh, recommend uh, to complete your redesign before you start teaching a new format of the course. Uh, but, and that's why I cannot say that how much uh, it, it takes time. And it, also, there are very different expectations. Uh, uh, for instance, we have been discussing in our university the, the uh, video lecture part, uh, because this is one thing that we learned during the first two weeks of uh, distance education in Zoom uh, in spring. So in Zoom, uh, you cannot uh, give long lectures anymore because they are so boring. Everybody goes asleep, they will switch their screen and the camera off and, and, and uh, they are gone. So it means that if it's a lecture, you have to pre-record it. And then we have like three different uh, quality levels and expectations. Uh, so one of my colleagues, uh, he says that absolute minimum for him is 4K. And uh, the equipment uh, that costs around 450 euros. And this is absolute minimum. He cannot uh, move his quality of the video lower than that. Uh, it includes wireless uh, microphones and everything. So uh, I would say most of my uh, colleagues are quite happy with this 50 euros, uh, a, a nice webcam with, with good microphone. Uh, this will do the trick. Uh, and then we have also professional educational technology support people in, in our university who, who would come with uh, 4K cameras, always two cameras from two different angles and so on. Professional uh, uh, cut and, and everything, uh, which makes it really expensive. So everybody has to set the, this, their expectation level where, where they feel comfortable, when they're, where their students feel comfortable. So there is no one single solution or answer. Thank you. Perfect, Mark. Thank you very much for the answer. I could very much agree with you because we have also tried out with a number of different uh, length of the videos, but the most efficient ones are like five to 10 minutes, but many more small ones, which are really something that the students will take a look at. And as for the uh, transferring course, maybe I can just point out to my example, we have had two courses that we have actually migrated, I would say, according to the instructional designs, fully into fully online courses, but three people were doing that as, as we go. So from week to week, and yes, in the end, we have had the course also redesigned, redesigned as the courses have ended <laughs> because we did Along, along the way. But now, yes, we have finished the courses that are 
pretty much good and in line with instructional design. And we even um, use the learning management system because, for example, I work with 300 students and we did the programmed learning. We did much, we did a bunch of rules within the system. So the uh, large number of students get the feedback from the system much more quicker than they would do it, for example, if I need to do it manually. But yes. Uh, thank you, Th thank you, Matt, very much. Um, as for the uh, Maria's question, if you can note uh, in question and answer session, there was a question from Tatiana and Maria uh, responded. No, so if, if if Tatiana has any other uh, questions, she can um, put it in um, the box as well. So at this stage, I would like to thank to both presenters. Marian and Mart, both for the presenting uh, part and for the discussion, very, very fr fruitful and um, quality discussion. Now let's move to the second part of this webinar that will be dealing with the integration of MOOCs in online learning courses. For this part, I would like to ask our dear guest, Jenkins Hakan Aydin, which is uh, who is a full professor at Andal University of Turkey, um, uh, to uh, share with us his presentation. Maybe just a few words about Professor Aydin. Except being a full professor in Andalu, uh, Anadolu University of Turkey, um, he has been there offering courses in the field of open and distance learning, and he has also served as, as instructional designer in the open education system. His current research interests focus on the design and development of open distance learning environments, integration of new technologies into open and distance learning, open educational resources, and massive open online courses. Professor Aydin is also a member of many respective international bodies related to education. So please, Professor Aydin, uh, share with us your presentation. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity and thank you for the nice introduction. Uh, let me uh, start with sharing my screen and the presentation. Uh, I promise I will try to be quick. Uh, although you mentioned there are two things I would like to express about myself. One of them is I have been trying to learn distance education since 85. It was the year 35 years ago, I start learning about distance education, open and distance learning, actually. This is how I call it. Uh, well, uh, and still trying to learn how we can uh, really provide better learning opportunities uh, through open and distance learning to the, um, to the to the everyone who wants to learn. The second one is about the last item uh, I have actually, I, I, I always say that I have 120 daughters uh, we have a basketball team, all, all of them almost are girls and they come from the vulnerable, vulnerable, vulnerable groups. So we try to provide them both education, a well education, and also um, try, to, try to make them good basketball players. One of them is currently playing in the Super League of Turkey. Are, I'm proud of it. And uh, the, another thing that I have been doing is this uh, what we call Akadema, uh, which is actually a MOOC platform. Uh, we started like five years ago, uh, now reached 120 courses uh, offered by Anadolu University professors. Majority of them, uh, currently 80 of them are uh, guided, st guided study mode, which means there are real instructors uh, who uh, interact with the students in these MOOC environment. Uh, we don't we don't have courses like millions of uh, students, but we have some some thousands of them. Uh, the, our instructors are struggling, but still, uh, it's a good challenge for them, and we learned a lot. Uh, I wanted to express this uh, MOOC platform because, uh, first of all, uh, we started it as I said five years ago, without before the pandemic and everything. Uh, the goal was to open up our uh, educational opportunities, our experiences, our resource to the everybody. But at the same time, we had two different uh, goals that we didn't really mention anywhere. 
The first one was to help instructors to acquire skills about teaching online. And we see now really well that it worked. Uh, those instructors who uh, offered courses in our environment uh, transferred their, uh, transferred their um, face-to-face courses easily into online mode uh, during the pandemic. So we reached our uh, one of our hidden goals. The second one was uh, also related uh, to train instructors, showing them that they can teach courses in different fields, not only social sciences, but also at the same time in science field, in medical science, in health uh, fields, and also in performing arts uh, like music and all the others. Uh, and that kind of physical uh, arts, all the, these kind of courses can be taught online. So we are proud that we did this project, especially now we are collecting our, you know, uh, it is, uh, its benefits, uh, especially during the pandemic and, uh, and now the next term. Uh, also, we are a part of Open Up Ed initiative uh, where I am also trying to help people uh, to sort of publicize, to share their uh, MOOCs, I mean, the European University MOOCs. And also, I would like to share uh, two of my courses, what I am doing is, uh, this is also started before pandemic. Since I believe in the power of MOOCs, uh, I, for example, in this course, it's a research methods in social sciences course. Uh, it's a master's level course. Uh, in this course, I ask my students choose one of the uh, MOOCs uh, where, where I prepare. I first uh, make a list uh, of courses that will start and end during the time of my course. Usually I choose a, a shorter courses like four or six weeks long courses. Uh, and I use Coursera courses, uh, edX courses, future learn courses, all different kinds of um, MOOC providers courses uh, and prepare a list that will uh, also uh, create a impact on my course and provide some more uh, experience to my students. For example, in this course, in research methods course, I usually choose some of the courses that are uh, focusing on that folks that are focusing on specific uh, statistics analysis and that kind of uh, courses. And I, I ask my students to complete at least one course. And from my, from my assessment rubric, you see that they get uh, 25% of their whole grade from completing that MOOC, which is really uh, a working method and um, and students are uh, showing real interest in this. Uh, so uh, as they are taking a course, usually gaining a certificate as an add-on to my course, plus they are completing one of the requirements of my course. I This is master's course, but at the same time, I use it in my um, undergraduate courses too. Here you see only 20, I gave only 20%, but uh, midterm is more uh, important here. So I, it's 30%, but 20% is for completing a MOOC is not really bad. And the course is about educational communications. Uh, so uh, this is the whole uh, assessment uh, system for me, for my courses. What we, uh, we've been telling everybody that I am also sort of consulting some of the universities uh, along with my university, in Turkey, and always telling professors that, especially during pandemic, they don't have to create all those materials uh, by themselves, or uh, they don't uh, try to create all different kinds of activities. Uh, of course, they have to design and they have to uh, they have to design own courses. They have to own their courses, but at the same time, as a part of their courses, they can use MOOCs, as I have been doing for years. And it works very well. Besides, not just courses, we can uh, sort of blend a program where we can use uh, some of the MOOCs as a part of the uh, 
uh, program requirement as a standalone course or courses st uh, students should complete to be able to get a credit uh, for their program. Uh, so this is also, there are some examples, not many in Turkey, uh, but in, uh, in other part of the world, there are a lot of examples and they're working very well. Uh, so we, uh, as for this presentation, my main message will be the please think about integrating MOOCs into your courses, individual courses. And at the same time, when you are designing a program, uh, think about available materials, available courses. Uh, so they can, they will be quite a good add-on or added value for your uh, courses and programs. Uh, not just integrating whole courses or programs, but at the same time, what you can do, there are a lot of nice pedagogical approaches in different MOOCs. Uh, so what I do is simply, I register a lot of MOOCs every time. I don't complete any of them, but I get really good design ideas out of those MOOCs and implement some of those pedagogical ideas or sort of um, sort of adapt those uh, ideas into my courses. And actually uh, students love to see different approaches, uh, approaches in, their, in my courses. So this is what I have been doing, but at the same time, we have a project, uh, five institutions uh, throughout Europe. Uh, we came together, uh, uh, FHM from Germany, uh, from Vlad, uh, Vlad from uh, University of Politecnica Trimoshora, uh, Kaunas University of Technology, my university, Anadolu University, and uh, Polytechnic University of Porto. We came together to, uh, uh, to design and uh, conduct this project. In this project, we are also focusing on how to integrate MOOCs or MOOC-based pedagogies into courses and also in the programs. Please uh, follow our uh, project uh, and also you can ask any question if you like. Uh, uh, that's, that's, that's my main message. That's my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, since you have been presenting, Hakan, there has been also a lively discussion going on in the chat window and in the questions and answers session. So I would like to invite you, uh, once you have time during uh, the session, to take a look at the questions and answers session and try to respond what you can. And maybe uh, if there are some um, questions still uh, pending, after we have this, the, the last presentation, then you can um, answer in live, okay? Yeah, sure, sure, thank you. Thank I will, I'm, I'm trying to look at the questions now, thank you. Okay. Thank you. And the last presenter, but not the least important, <laughs> uh, is, is, is our colleague Vlad, who is, as uh, already mentioned in the beginning, Eden Knapp uh, Chair, Steering Committee Chair. Uh, Vlad is with the Faculty of Electronics, Telecommunications and Information Technology, Polytechnic University of Temeshwara. Vlad holds a PhD in Educational and Technological Models of MOOCs and has more than 10 years experience as a trainee and teacher in areas like multimedia technology, social media, e-tourism, e-learning, usability, programming, soft skill, and etc. He has authored over uh, 25 scientific papers and book chapters published in international conferences and journals. He is also um, involved in several European research projects in the field of e-learning. Vlad, please, now the floor is yours. Thank you, Igor, for this uh, very nice presentation. Um, it's very difficult to, to present after uh, so, so good presentations from our colleagues. Uh, and so interesting presentations when you get uh, in your head all the good debates and questions. Um, it's, it's, it's very, very hard not to switch from what you were talking, what you were preparing and just continue the discussion started in the chat. But this is what uh, makes a good uh, uh, webinar interactive. And I'm really happy that we can we have this opportunity to 
both present and then interact uh, via the, those, these Q and A's. So I'm going to talk about how we integrate MOOCs uh, in our university, in the Polytechnic University of uh, Timisoara. And you will see that our approach is in uh, some ways similar to the one uh, from uh, Anadolu University, which you just uh, saw from uh, our colleague Hakan uh, just previously. So we have been integrating uh, MOOCs and OERs into our courses since 2013. Uh, we are around 20 teachers from my university who are doing this, and uh, we do this in over 20 courses. The most of them are from master programs, and uh, but also some from bachelor programs. Uh, our university is uh, mainly an engineering one, so uh, most of these courses are ICT related. Uh, of course, during these times, uh, much more teachers uh, joined our ranks and I'm sure if uh, if we ask correctly uh, these numbers will grow. So I'm going to give you one uh, particular example of how you can easily integrate MOOCs into your courses. What we do is we identify a list of MOOCs and students are given this list so that they can each choose one MOOC uh, to follow. For example, if we have a, a course related to programming then we look for MOOCs uh, which are related to that topic. We uh, try to find MOOCs both uh, from several platforms uh, from all over the world. Not only in English, we try to offer several languages so that the language barrier is overpassed. What the students need to do after following, after choosing the MOOC is to follow that. Uh, they are not uh, required to pay for anything, so they only have to do the activities which are free. Uh, after they finish, they need to do a report, which is graded. The report contains their experience during that MOOC. Not only what they learned, but also how they felt, uh, how they, what they think about the usability aspects, about uh, learning design, so that we can see what, uh, what they love and what they hate about these courses. In the end, they do a, a presentation in a plenary session with all of their colleagues so that uh, they can interact with each other and ask uh, questions. After that, after we finish, we do an anonymous questionnaire to evaluate their work and to help us in our research for further improvement of our courses. So if you see that students tend to like uh, several some aspects of a course, you can then try to uh, redesign your course, uh, taking them into consideration. This is, is in, uh, in respect to the discussion uh, which uh, just started uh, in the chat uh, 10 minutes ago about using and uh, involving students for redesigning our courses. Our students need to show us uh, the completion rates of their courses. You see here some courses from uh, an European project we were involved in, Open Virtual Mobility, which has very nice courses, uh, still free and available. And uh, uh, students uh, were taking the screenshots uh, besides writing reports so that they can prove also their involvement in the courses. Also, they show us the badges they received. Uh, many of our students were not familiar with digital badges. And the fact that they can use these digital badges to improve their e-portfolios and to promote uh, their work and their achievements on social media was very interesting for them. What were the conclusions of this type of activity? The students loved the freshness of this idea, the, the novelty of uh, uh, listening for to, to a different type of course, not the same courses they were used to in our university, um, because they, they, they think outside the box if, if they change the, the type of course. Uh, also, they, they had some challenges because la the language barrier can be a challenge, and also they experienced uh, various frustrations uh, in regards to peer assessment, for example. Uh, when they put effort and passion into uh, assessing the uh, a task and their peer does not, then we can see some frustrations. And if you don't know who that person is, then they 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 don't uh, they don't know how to solve that. Also, the participation was very good because they had the opportunity to learn an, in an international environment, which is very good for them. And they find it useful because since they have the possibility to choose from a list, then they usually choose something that is useful for them, for their careers, for their interests. So they have the possibility to learn something uh, X, something besides what uh, we already uh, are planning to, to show them in, in our courses.
Uh, we are doing not only integration of outside uh, MOOCs in our university, we also developed our own uh, MOOC platform, uh, Unicampus it's called, which uh, uh, is, is the first Romanian MOOC platform. It was initiated by uh, the e-learning center from my university in 2014, uh, and it is based on Moodle since uh, uh, most of uh, Romanian universities are using Moodle as their uh, LMS platforms. Also, we developed a mobile app for uh, this uh, for this platform. Uh, it is not very populated yet with courses. We are working on it, but there are some courses, uh, especially in uh, in uh, relation to open educational resources and uh, digital skills from uh, various uh, events and workshops which we held. Um, students and uh, whoever uh, registers to this open platform can access uh, videos and the presentations uh, which are which were presented uh, in that uh, section. We also put some assignments so that uh, they feel more course alike. Also in, uh, inside this platform, what we uh, inserted was a course uh, related to another project which we are involved in, a project where we also uh, involve students for um, testing the usability and uh, of the learning design. So the project is digital culture and uh, uh, its purpose is to improve the digital competencies uh, and the social inclusion, inclusion of adults in uh, the creative industries. Since creative industries are extremely large as an area, then uh, we can find something in this course for each student, uh, uh, no matter their, um, their interest and their specialization. The purpose of this was to enhance awareness of uh, the need for training in digital skills for creative industries, also to design and validate cross-country guidelines for digital competencies for the creative industries. We created uh, an, an integrated virtual learning hub, which I already mentioned, Unicampus. And in this uh, hub, we design, develop, and deliver a digital skills and social inclusion for creative industries course. This is translated into all partners of uh, languages, and it has a lot of MOOCs and OERs uh, uh, integrated. We also introduce digital skills e-assessment and open badges in creative industries, and we try to encourage collaboration uh, for, for in this respect. Um, inside uh, this uh, big MOOC, we have 13 mini MOOCs, 13 mini courses, which are designed each as an individual MOOC on topics which vary from uh, internet basics to uh, digital uh, safety, AR, VR, social media, and uh, several other uh, interesting topics which you can uh, see. And as I said, we uh, try to, to think this as a multi-language multi online platform and uh, where the courses are hosted uh, entirely. You can see here how it looks. As I said, we have the 13 courses. Uh, some of them are already available. Some of them will be in the near future. And all of them are thought for a basic level training. What is included in these courses uh, are OERs, our best practices in the field, uh, are various examples from culture and technology, also examples of digital artists and various study cases which can be useful for uh, students and participants. Also, as I said, we uh, introduce digital uh, open badges for the DigiCulture project, which uh, will offer the, the participants also the possibility to share this in their e-portfolio. Um, I want to, uh, to leave you with some things to remember. Why to integrate these courses and why to involve students in, in uh, MOOC courses, MOOC design and, uh, and uh, in, in your traditional uh, education. For students, it is uh, a very good new learning experience. They develop several skills in autonomy, critical thinking, digital literacy, creativity, collaboration. Uh, they curate information. They learn how to analyze and synthesize if you uh, ask them to do the reports. And also their satisfaction levels are very high. They were very happy with this activity. And then for us, the teachers, we, can, we have the opportunity to curate, curate the MOOCs and OERs, and we also get new skills. We learn how to do, do a better evaluation, to do a better assessment. We improve our digital literacy. We can learn how to facilitate local learning communities. And last but not least, we get fresh new courses. So thank you for um, listening to this presentation. You can contact me uh, on either of these uh, channels and uh, I'm uh, happy to answer uh, questions and to see what other questions are for my fellow uh, speakers. Thank you. Igor? Thank you a lot. Thank you very much. 
Uh, yes, there has been some discussion developed in the questions and answers session. Uh, since we are uh, pretty much running out of time, I noticed one interesting question here, maybe for both presenters. Uh, it's uh, what should be the evaluation strategy if we want to integrate MOOC or OBR courses in an academic program? So this is the question I I would like to pinpoint in the, from the from the um, chat window and maybe and maybe um, you can refer or Hakam can refer to this uh, question. Let me go first. Actually, I typed uh, in the answer, but uh, briefly about the evaluation. Uh, we, I ask students to reflect on what they learn. And I, I follow up students' progress. I always, every week or every two weeks, I ask students what they learned in that course. And I use that as, a, uh, as one of the uh, assessment strategy, uh, self-evaluation, self-reflection of the student. I think uh, it's, a, uh, it's an important uh, tool. Vlad, your turn. You have more to say. <laughs> So actually, I, I agree with uh, what uh, what you are saying. Um, the evaluation strategy um, should be uh, a mixed one because we need to take into account uh, the uh, the experience of uh, our teachers and uh, uh, to take into account the 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 whole purpose of the program where we are introducing this uh, MOOC or or we are but. On the other hand, we need to take into account the, the opinion of students because we are designing the courses for students. We make many times this mistake that we think that we design the courses for us. We think that they are fine. They are very good courses, but we are not asking uh, the students what they think about the courses. Maybe what we say that are what is that is fine is it, it is not fine at all for them. So I think that the process of the of evaluating the strategy of integration should go both ways, both the teacher side and the uh, academia and also the students. Of course, students has to present a certification or at least if it's free, at least a letter of uh, letter or an email showing that they completed the course. And that's what, why I was saying uh, we also do at the end uh, uh, a plenary discussion where we can ask some questions so that we realize the quality of uh, that OER, that MOOC. And if, if, if we have a little bit, a little more experience with this, then we can easily find out from those questions, uh, from the answers of the students, if it is good quality or not. Um, I also saw one question, if uh, I'm allowed, uh, I think it was also for, for Hakan from Ken. He was asking, how, uh, how, do you, how do we scale these ideas? Because there are many instances where we have both good and bad uh, examples, uh, and it is very difficult to scale integration of, uh, of MOOCs into courses. Maybe Hakan can try an answer for this one as well. Um. Well, I think it depends on the, the context. Uh, there are some instances uh, still uh, you, can, uh, you can sort of scale up that idea and you can integrate. There are, you know, there are a lot of examples like MicroMasters or short learning programs. Uh, you can use uh, that kind of ideas in, to scale the, all these um, on the scale up the, your project or this integration. Um, even, for example, in my undergraduate courses, I have like 50 students. Uh, 50 is for some people may not be too many, but still it is a big group. Uh, I think uh, I'm doing well following uh, or monitoring what they are doing in those MOOCs. Uh, so, uh, but if I, I cannot imagine if it's like a hundred or something uh, to measure, but uh, the idea is uh, someone, Elsa, for example, wrote peer assessment, self-assessment, 
Uh, those are the ideas we should integrate our courses to be able to also scale up uh, those integrations. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, maybe final final question for all presenters. Uh, you have presented, I would say, uh, pretty much in line with your subtopics. And now what we would like to maybe see for the end, according to your opinion, what is the biggest challenge in the field for Mart and Maria in Marian in the field of uh, this uh, instructional and learning design, moving or switching from face to face to online course, and maybe for Vlad and um, Hakan in respect to integration of MOOCs in online courses. Maybe we can go um, by the order of presentation. Yes, uh, I'd say that the, the probably the biggest challenge uh, is, is not uh, skills to use some new tools because you can acquire them very fast once once you get started. Uh, I think the, the biggest challenge is uh, to uh, leave go the, the your old design when you start to redesign the the, the new course with, with the same content uh, to the new format uh, uh, and uh, you, you probably cannot uh, let it go uh, at, at the first uh, try uh, so that's why i, I say that uh, I, I really like this agile and iterative uh, redesign process that you move step by step you continuously uh, reflect and on, on uh, what went wrong uh, and, and you involve your students in, in giving some ideas and making the course more appealing uh, uh, challenging and, and interesting for them engaging uh, uh, but uh, yeah it takes it takes some time and uh, it uh, probably uh, needs a, a really uh, I would say in, in Estonian language, we say the cold stomach. It means that you, you need to handle lots of uncertainty. Uh, and uh, not all people can, uh, especially among teachers and lecturers in universities, can handle uh, in such level of uncertainty, uh, especially if they've been teaching the same course for years and years in face-to-face -face mode. But uh, yeah. It's like with uh, swimming. Once you jump in the water and start move your legs and uh, and and uh, and hand, uh, you probably will survive. And uh, over the time, you will polish your skills and uh, will be ready to listen the, the the guidelines of the experts. In in our case, the instructional designers. Uh, thank, thank you. you. But 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 you shouldn't stop moving your hands and legs, otherwise you will. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mark. Maria, just a quick or short. Yeah, I, I think that Mark opened the question. It's a uh, um, let go, you know, and uh, change mind uh, is the biggest challenge, I guess. And it's not, you know, that uh, the old uh, teachers has the most problem. I could see that the. Some of my colleagues that are, you know, having 30 years of experience, I guess, uh, they switch immediately because this has, this is a challenge. But then I can see the younger uh, colleagues that uh, they couldn't uh, leave their chalk, you know, so that's, that's the problem. I think that's, uh, that's a mentality, how to change it, how to leave the comfort zone, how to, how to live something that has worked before to something that is new, that's untested. And I think that, uh, that uh, this corona is not just bad. I think it's good because we were forced to change. And because we were forced to change, everybody can see that this is not something that is unfeasible, untested, untrustful, you know, because, but as I said before, some did it better than the others. And um, if you just give the assignment to the students and leave them for months and not uh, having a discussion with them, then uh, this is not the online course. I think this is self-study. But if you, if you have a 
conversation with them, then it's also a problem with the teacher and student because they find out that uh, the working hours of a day has extended. It is not just from you know, eight to five or something like these, eight hours a day, but it starts you know, in early morning and it starts late at night or may maybe early hours in night. Because when you, when you are always online and when you try to, to give the students responses, and during the midnight, I I've find, I find myself, you know, that I actually am kind of stupid because I was answering students at one o'clock at night when I shouldn't actually. I, I should give them a good example not to, you know, not to let these uh, gadgets rule your life. And I think that uh, we will have to work on this uh, topic too. Thank you, Marian. Thank you very much. Okay, and now let's move to Hakan. To um, well, actually, I agree with the previous uh, panelists. They, they already expressed some of my ideas. I will say one of the biggest problems is resistance. Resistance of the instructors at the same time, resistance of the or mind, uh, minds of the students also. Uh, they uh, they are coming uh, like in higher education. They are coming with uh, some preconceptions about learning uh, they acquired during the, their K twelve education. And uh, when you try to do something different, uh, they resist you. At the same time, instructors resist you to change their mindset. So that's the biggest challenge we've been dealing, uh, at least in the institutions that I am involved in. Uh, but uh, the solution is simple. Uh, they tested that they can do it at a distance. They can use some technologies. Now our challenge is to, uh, to, to at the same time, to change their preconceptions that they gained during that pandemic, during last semester, because majority of the people uh, started to um, teach only by uh, with the, the synchronous tools. It is not distance education, this is just an imitation. We have to also deal with this uh, mindset. Uh, but uh, what happens when you ask them, especially if the uh, university or if the institution administrators uh, support you uh, and when you show them the right ways uh, when they start swimming and moving their hands and um, uh, legs uh, they change easily that is what I saw and there's one more thing we have to be careful about intellectual property rights uh, that's a big challenge for many instructors to resist sharing their materials, sharing their um, designs. And we have to have good uh, uh, leg legislations to keep their, to, to secure their intellectual property rights. Thank you. Perfect, Hakan. Thank you very much. Vlad? Um. As uh, all of these challenges also apply to me, I'm going to move on a, a different uh, layer. Uh, one of my main challenges now is how to design the courses with the correct amount of activities for students in order not to overwhelm them. Because many of, uh, of us now, when we moved to online, we thought, okay, we, we need to, to give more activities to students because they have more time to do them uh, because we don't, care, we don't uh, ask them to come to school. So we overwhelm them with many activities, especially if all of them have the, the deadlines in the same period at the end of the semester and we don't evaluate, uh, as Marian said, from time to time, then they will do everything in the last minute and they will do a poor job. And we are going to stress them a lot. So I don't have a solution for this, still working on it, but I think this is uh, my challenge. Thank you. Very nice, very nice. As we could have seen, uh, it's not simple to define only one note and say, yes, this is the <laughs> main issue, but rather we have many, many parallel things that needs to be tackled and uh, um, re responded to. 
So in the end, I would like to thank once more and again to first to the presenters and then to all of you who took the time uh, to attend this session, who put your voice in the chat window, who have discussed with us. Uh, so thank you for your active participation and very fruitful discussion. It has been a pleasure to listen to all the presentations and to um, also being part of this um, lively, lively discussion during today's session. On behalf of Vlad and me and on behalf of the Eden Lab Steering Committee, on behalf of organizers, uh, I wish you all a very nice day and kindly invite you to follow Eden and Eden Lab webinars in the future. Thank you very much. Take care and have a nice day.